Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, my name is Tom, and I am an alcoholic, <laughs> and I'm in great need of 100,000 Al-Anon meetings. Um, thanks for the invitation to come to Crested Butte. I have not been in this part of the world before, and I envy you your reign. Um, I'm from Northern California, and we are dry, so I, I had a little envy and resentment, uh, but it passed. It passed. Um, I got a letter. Uh, the, 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 the committee prepares, and you get lots of letters and lots of information, and there was one of the letters said, and we expect you to wear a tie. <laughs> Good luck. Um, and I, 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 I don't. Um, and I suggested an alternative, and they graciously yielded. <laughs> I'm one of those Catholic priests who's sober. Uh, there's lots of us. There's lots more that need to be. Um, and it's interesting... Uh, so many of, I, I'm a member of the Jesuit community. I noticed there's a Jesuit t-shirt back there. I want to congratulate you on, on uh, your common sense and clear wisdom. Um, I, uh, it, it's, it's all part of my being alive. Um, in the night 1960s, uh, the leadership um, uh, of my community and, and a lot of church groups got educated on alcoholism. The National Council on Alcoholism came and and there were a couple of other groups, and they talked to these communities and bishops and, and, and church folk, uh, telling them that alcoholism was not a moral failing, it was not shameful, it was a disease, uh, treatment was possible. If some of your folks are getting into trouble, get them some help. And it takes a while, but you know, and you have to keep teaching people that. Um, but I'm, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm alive today. I, I'm not the kind of guy who asks for help. Uh, if I'm in trouble, rule number one, don't tell anyone. Rule number two, try harder. Uh, rule number three, keep secrets, you know. And I um, uh, was intervened on. There were members of my community who had been worried for a long time. For a period of any evening when I'm drinking, I am very loud <laughs> and very extroverted. This will change. Uh, <laughs> And I'll get in a fight with you about politics or religion, um, and and then uh, black out and not remember several days. And uh, there were years of that. And somebody uh, referred to me once. I was kind of eavesdropping on a conversation, and they referred to me in this uh, as being full of piss and vinegar. And I thought that was pretty good, um, <laughs> but it wasn't. It's it was a, it was a, it's a bad thing. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm an intervened upon person, and uh, I know I, I live in Oakland, California. I I'm, I'm, uh, live most of my life out there. I've, gone, I've lived in Los Angeles and uh, sober and drunk, and I've lived in uh, uh, Berkeley. That's where I did get sober. I was studying theology at the Graduate Theological School, which is a good place to learn. There were um, nine different denominations and 12 different schools, and you got to study together, which I think is very good news. So I had just uh, finished my second year of theology. Um, I was going to be ordained a priest the next year, and I got intervened on. Uh, I, I was intervened on when I was 29 years old. Um, I, I, I thought if I just tried harder, I'd get it. You know, I mean, you're, you're cutting me off before I learn how to drink successfully. Uh, and I got put into a 21-day treatment program, and I got out of treatment on a Friday and started my third year of theology on a Monday. And the community was extremely supportive. They didn't understand a lot, but they were very supportive. Uh, my spiritual director, who I just got an email from this past week, I can't, he reminded me of how gracious he was and kind. I, uh, <laughs> what a good thing, you know. Um, and I, I went to meetings. Um, uh, 
So um, let's see that, that. So sobriety data in Texas, you give sobriety dates. Um, my first day without a drink was the day that Gerald Ford was nominated for president of the United States. <laughs> I had to look it up too. Uh, <laughs> And it was August 18th of 1976. It was during the convention. And, uh, boy, I, I really was a mess. I thought I was in a little bit of trouble. I, I had a conversation a few years ago with one of our Franciscan brothers who was drowning in booze and dope. And, and uh, oh, they were going to dry him out someplace. And, and he, with, with just the sincerity of the addict's heart, said to me, I know I may have a tiny little problem with crystal meth, but I think I think it's going to be okay. And I I just pray, you know, I, I wish you well, you know. And and he went into treatment, and lightning struck, and he became alive again and passionately involved in the program and recovery. It is just. Such a good thing to see that happen. Anyway, that's not my story. That's his. I went to a lot of meetings. I found one of the reasons I'm still alive today is I liked meetings. Uh, we didn't have big meetings. We had uh, almost one meeting a night. Uh, 20 people was a lot of people. 30 people was a lot of people. This was in Berkeley, California. And we all were depressed. And we all smoked cigarettes. And we all quoted our therapists. And... Um, <laughs> We use very big words like existential and uh, uh, quoted Bill Wilson, Martin Heidegger. It was very confusing. Anyway, so um, I found at meetings I was interested in what you had to say. I like meetings better than TV, and I'm a TV watcher. Uh, in fact, over the years, I have watched more TV than meetings, and... Uh, someone pointed out to me that at one part of my recovery, for all practical purposes, Judge Judy was my sponsor. <laughs> and, um, and that's not good. Just so you know, that's not good. Um, I'm, uh, let me tell you a little bit about drinking. Oh, and someone else, you know, people have funny ideas about clergy. Someone said, well, how could a priest be an alcoholic, and the answer is, with any luck at all, you can be an alcoholic. <laughs> I uh, uh, was a high school teacher. Jesuits teach. Uh, we're in, in high schools and universities. We do a lot of things like that. I always wanted to be a teacher, and I my first teaching assignment was in Los Angeles, and I um, found alcohol to be a great help in teaching high school students. <laughs> I was sober a bit, and I went back to teach sober. And I, I'll tell you, for me, it was easier to teach when I was drinking. Um, I had to learn a lot to teach sober, but that's a whole different conversation. Talk about the drinking. I'm a daily drinker. Uh, there's alcoholism in the home. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. Half the family is uh, Irish, Catholic, Democrats. And uh, on that side of the family... We don't have alcoholics. We have characters. <laughs> and we say things like, so-and-so is sure a character. And it took me a few years of sobriety to realize that in my family, and perhaps yours, code was spoken. <laughs> and you had to know the code. And if you didn't know the code, you missed out on a lot. <laughs> no one in my family had cancer. Instead, they're not feeling well. Uh, I missed a couple of people because of that. I, 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 they told me, but they didn't tell me, and I didn't know. And then why didn't you go see? I didn't know. I thought she had a cold. <laughs> On the Swedish Lutheran Republican side of the family, <laughs> we didn't have alcoholics either. We had nervous people. And, and uh, my mom is, is right off the boat. She was born and raised in Sweden and in the southern part uh, of the country. And when she was 16, was sent over to Minnesota 
um, to be a good Swedish American and lived there until she moved to California, met my dad in the 1930s. Um, but we, it, and alcoholism is everywhere in that family, everywhere. I'm the youngest of all the first cousins. And uh, I'm... Um, I was sober for a bit and my mom called me. She never made it to Al-Anon. She was surrounded by alcoholics. Um, she believed in the power of denial. <laughs> and she called me about one of the neighbors. She said, so-and-so is very strange. He parks his car on the lawn and falls asleep next to it. And what do I think? <laughs> And I have been to college. So I said, does he drink very much? And she said, of course not, but he's very nervous. <laughs> and if my mother noticed that you were nervous, it meant you were ready for treatment. That's what it meant. <laughs> she, in fact, at one occasion will refer to her own mother as being a very nervous person. So there's, there's family stuff. I'm uh, sober. I got sober in August. I was gotten sober in August. Um, Christmas, I was in Berkeley. My folks lived in San Jose, which is uh, an hour drive. And I went down for Christmas Eve, and we were going to have a gathering of the Irish Catholic Democrats and the Swedish Lutheran Republicans. And uh, I was a little nervous. Uh, and... <laughs> And I was about, what, August, September, October, four months sober. I had, I had no skin on. I was just raw nerve endings. And I looked pretty jumpy. And my mom said to me, um, what's wrong? But she, it took her 20 minutes because you have to warm up to that, you know, and kind of get close to the topic and back away. And uh, if you're a Star Trek person, and I am, there's a game called Vulcan Chess, and it's three-dimensional, and that's having a conversation in my family. <laughs> you moves here and moves there, and you, it, it's very subtle, and you're in code. So it, she said, finally said, what's wrong? And I thought she wanted to know. <laughs> now, parents don't. What they want to hear is, I've got a little gas. It'll be okay. <laughs> But I said, well, here's a moment for mother-son intimacy. And I thought I heard at a meeting, if you tell the truth, the whole family gets well. I thought I heard that. Now, that's not true. Do not try this at home. But I figured, well. So I said, well, uh, I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink since August, and I'm pretty nervous about tonight. And she was setting the table, and she put down the silverware and looked at me and said, you'll ruin Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Only alcoholics laugh at that. I don't, I don't know why that is, uh, but I think it's hilarious too. And then I realize, I, again, I have completely misread the family dynamics, and I backed up and I said, okay, 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 it's not alcoholism, it's a drinking problem. And she said, oh, that's okay, we have a lot of those. Just, just don't be alcoholic, because you get labeled, you know, you'll get labeled. Uh, very nervous about the neighbors. So a few years pass, and uh, she turned to me. I'm driving. She's in the car. My dad's in the back seat. She turns to me, and she said, how bad was it? Now, there was no introduction to that. <laughs> you know, this is, but she's been thinking. <laughs> Swedish people are very much like this, by the way. You think for years, and then you ask. And I had been sober for a little bit, and I was sane enough to know that this is not the time to do a fifth step with your parents. Very bad idea. Not recommended. And I had a little moment of inspiration from the Spirit, and I said it's bad, it was bad enough so that I never want to drink again. Silence. A couple of years pass. <laughs> I'm driving, she's in the car, he's in the back, and she says, why didn't you come to us? Let the family take care of its secrets, you know, which is... Ah. Um, and again, I had a little more sobriety. My first thought was just to pull the car into oncoming traffic and end, <laughs> end this tragedy. 
Instead, again, the spirit moved, and I said, what could you have done? And she said, I don't know. And I said, exactly. I had to go somewhere where they knew what to do, and, and that's why I'm still alive. I go to places where they know what to do with alcoholism and alcoholic thinking and alcoholic behavior and alcoholics. And I think that satisfied her a little bit. But moms and dads worry a lot. They worry a lot. Anyway, daily drinker. Also drunk driver. Um, I grew up in San Jose and got my driver's license when I was 16, and I think I was driving uh, impaired shortly thereafter. Never killed anybody, was never in an accident, uh, never got a ticket, got stopped once, trying to cross the bridge from San Francisco into Oakland, a very long bridge. If you're stoned, it's a very <laughs> long bridge. Are we still on the bridge? Yeah, oh no. And a police officer, uh, highway patrol sheriff, pulled me up and, and uh, he said, uh, where are you headed? And I said, home. He said, where is home? I said, Berkeley. He said, go there. So um, I heard my sponsor. My sponsor is a hopeless alcoholic of the worst kind. I, I got a chance to spend a good portion of last week with him in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, I just don't listen to him. I watch him. Watch what he does. Watch how he interacts with people. And I'll even, he's, he's, he's been, he got sober on St. Patrick's Day of 1971, which is kind of sad for an Irish priest, you know. <laughs> Um, but I've heard talks that he gives, and I can hear him. I can listen to him. I can't do that with some people. And he was talking about being a drunk driver, and he said, uh, I'm a drunk driver. Pause. That means I was willing to kill you. <laughs> and I went, oh, my, I think I'm going to mention that when I share from now on. I was willing to kill you. Um, I took... Uh, the senior citizens driving course for AARP two years ago. And they, they don't talk so much about the danger of drunk driving. They presume you know that. But they said, you know, sleepy driving is as bad. I found that very important. When I'm, when I'm a little drowsy, I pull off the road and take a little nap instead of, oh, it's only another 10 miles, pull off the road. And angry driving is as bad as drunk driving. I do not want to be a dangerous driver as a sober person. And I'm very aware, uh, you know, what, what is your spiritual condition, Tom? I know as soon as I get behind the wheel. <laughs> if I let you go first, if I come to a complete stop at a stop sign, not light, um, if I let pedestrians cross the road, I'm a sober driver. And when I run the red light or almost kill a pedestrian, uh, I, sh I have to pay attention. Wake up! You're driving! Oh, I forgot. Um, I, I had symptoms. Uh, as a kid, I loved alcohol. I liked playing with it. Um, I, I remember as a little kid having to get up on a, st a chair, and you take a bottle of cream de menthe, you know, and you take a hit out of that, and sugar, power, green. And... I wasn't a stupid kid, so I didn't drink a lot of cream de mint because it's green and there's evidence, you know. <laughs> I remember uh, drinking bourbon out of the bottle, and that was magic. Uh, I hit a bourbon out of the bottle, and then I'd go to the refrigerator and take a can of Hershey syrup and take a good mouthful of Hershey syrup. That's good drinking when you're eight, let me tell you. <laughs> And I'm a little older, uh, maybe early high school, and I, uh, we had a, my dad had a bottle of tequila in the back, which he never drank, so I did. And on one occasion, uh, it was uh, I tried a, a tequila milkshake, vanilla ice cream tequila, blend it. And I remember drinking it out of the container, and my first thought was, this is awful. And then I drank the whole thing, which is a bad sign. It's a bad sign. One of my favorite stories... Uh, I love the stories in the back of the book. I know that's controversial in some places, but I love the stories in the back of the book. And uh, in the third edition, there was uh, one about this guy who uh, 
uh, Roadhouse, Akron, I think it's entitled, he had to be shown or something, I don't remember right now, but he goes with a bunch of his pals, they're high school kids, and they go to uh, a bar, a, a, a restaurant, Roadhouse, there's a bar, uh, they sit around and uh, he asks all of his little high school pals, 17, 18 year old boys, you guys want to have a drink? Pause. And they say, I'll have a beer. I'll have a beer. I'll have a beer. I'll. So they all have beers. And he said, I ordered a martini extra dry. <laughs> he said, I didn't even know what a martini looked like, but I saw the guy at the end of the bar and he ordered one. So I just watched. And he picked up his drink and sniffed of it and put it down. So I picked up my drink and sniffed of it and put it down. He took a couple of hits off his cigarette. I took a couple of hits off my cigarette. He downed half of his martini. I downed half of mine. And it nearly blew the top of my head off. <laughs> it irritated my nostrils. I choked. I hated it. There was nothing about that martini that I liked. He uh, ate his olive. I ate mine. I didn't even like the olive. He finished his martini. I finished mine. There was nothing about that drink that I liked, period. And then he says, I drank nine martinis in less than an hour. I know that kid. I know that kid real well. Uh, Doctor, uh, one of the, the men I've, I've grown to love in the program was a physician who was sober uh, from French Canada originally. He, he uh, uh, was a little boy uh, in Canada during Prohibition, and he saw the Americans coming over to Canada to get drunk because you could get drunk legally there and have fistfights and throw up. And he would see these drunken Americans and said, what a great country, I can't wait to get there. <laughs> And he went through medical school and learned English very, very well. And he came down to San Francisco to begin his medical practice. His name was Dr. Gill, Dr. Gill Ayat. And Gill, uh, uh, Gill was smart. I like smart. It's not enough, but I like smart. Gill was educated. I like educated, too. Uh, it's not enough, but I like educated. He was also wise. He was a smart, educated, wise man. And um, he got sober when General Eisenhower was president. And then he had a little relapse under Mr. Kennedy. And then he got sober under Lyndon Johnson, which is a miracle of grace. And Gill spends his life helping people get well. And he just didn't treat people. He began to teach alcoholism and teach our craziness. And, and Gil became one of my mentors. He passed about three years ago at the age of 93 or 94, I think. One of the great uh, recovering folks on the, on the West Coast. I liked him oh so much. And I would hear Gil talk about stuff. And Gil would say things like, alcoholism is a disease that has three distinct phases. The first phase is the fun phase. This is when it's fun. <laughs> and, you know, I sure had fun for a long time. I, I, especially in high school, I was a sissy. I was an awkward kid. I didn't play sports. I didn't feel like I fit in. I had all kinds of questions about a lot of things. Give me a couple of drinks. In fact, just one. And I'm confident and mature and masculine and strong. And I could dance, you know? <laughs> it was really fun. So that's stage one. Stage two alcoholism is called fun plus problems. It's still fun. <laughs> but you start to have problems, you know? You, you black out and you show up drunk for work or you show up drunk for school, whether you're a student or a teacher. You uh, have, have difficulty with your, your family, uh, health problems. Uh, unfortunate urination events. Um, <laughs> and then stage three is just called problems. <laughs> and I think the first step asks a question. And the question is, are you still having any fun? And if you're still having fun with your drinking, we don't look good to you, you know? 
Uh, if you have the gift of desperation, we look good. You know, G-O-D, the gift of desperation. If you are bleeding and on fire, you might go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Now, this is true for joining other programs, too. I joined now and on when I was six or seven years sober, but I was teaching kids, and I, I just, they were driving me crazy. And I, I did some social work, and I had no, no, I was, I was so angry and so exhausted and so tired, and I, I started doing some Alan, and I'll get back to that, but, but I, I mention that sometimes when I share it in an AA meeting. Uh, I say I went, I, go to, I went to Al-Anon because I did not want to be a sober person who was shooting people. <laughs> and at my home group meeting, it's a little men's meeting, a little Al-Anon meeting on, when, on Monday nights. Uh, we read one of those books, and oh man, you know, it's every week, it's something difficult to chew on. Um, our discussion is, do you shoot to kill, <laughs> or do you shoot to maim? <laughs> and the benefit of maiming them is they'll remember who you are. <laughs> I think that's a good conversation to have. Anyway... Um, so I started going to Al-Anon, I found it helpful, and I mentioned that at a meeting, and after a meeting, this lady came up to me, and she said, I'm seven years sober, and I hate everyone. Is it time to go to Al-Anon? <laughs> and my answer is, hold out as long as you can. <laughs> you know? <laughs> if you go too early, you're not going to like them. There's too many of these and not enough of those, and... Oh, my God, knitting, you know. I mean, if, if knitting is going to stay, go. When you're desperate, you don't care what they're doing. You're just glad to be there. Oh. I, I didn't have a lot of trouble with step one, um, powerless and unmanageable. Those were new words to me, but th that wasn't. Uh, I'm, I'm not an optimist, uh, half Irish, half Swedish. We're not perky people. Um, we're kind of depressed and kind of, salt, you know, it's not going to work out. The sun is burning out. The polar bears are drowning, and how are you? I mean, I, that's how my day starts. Uh, when, I, when I first started going to meetings in 1976, uh, I would bump into two-step people. They said, I'm a two-stepper. I like doing one and twelve, nothing in the middle. One and twelve. And the way I hear that is, you know, step one says, we're doomed. <laughs> There's no way out. Uh, General Custer, more are coming. Um, <laughs> step one. Noah, it's still rainy. I mean, this step one is not a happy step. Step 12, join us. I was at a meeting in Sacramento, an AA meeting, and, and I, I'm sure it doesn't happen here, but some AA meetings have a lot of rules. You have to know the code, you know? And... Um, this particular meeting in Sacramento, if there was a newcomer present, you could only talk about step one. And I just found that so odd. I guess they just don't want to give the newcomer any hope. <laughs> my difficulty has always been step two. And to my understanding and my experience, step two is all about hope. It's, it's, it lets me know there's a way out rather than just being powerless and unmanageable. Uh, Bill in the 12 and 12 writes about step two, and it's all faith, belief, faith, belief, faith, belief, faith, belief. <laughs> Not my story. I had faith. I had belief. At one time, I could do this in Latin, Greek, and Spanish, and English, and I was still drunk. 
My problem was there was just no hope. And I want to talk about that for a little bit and, and maybe explain it to you, um, although I think some of you will understand. See, here's my, my deal. I am unique. <laughs> and I am special. And I am different. And I know the program can work for you because you are simple people. <laughs> But the rules that apply to you don't apply to me. Now, this is called despair. That's what this is called. And I've always believed that. All, I mean, I, I have so many ways where anything that would help you could not apply to me, and I sure brought that into the program. And I, I just, uh, I hope, hope. Uh, I, I remember fairly early, uh, hope was the topic, and, and here was my understanding of, of hope. Coming in here. If you people would promise me that if I did all the meetings and did all the books and did all the inventories and had a sponsor, if you promised me that if I did that, it wouldn't get worse. I thought that was hope. Never that it would get better or different. Are you crazy? You know, we're at the end here. I'm 29. <laughs> and I went to a lot of meetings. And uh, the spirit that lives in the room lifted me. Not right away, not fast, not a lot, but a little. And eight months, nine months, ten months of sobriety, I realized that I was breathing. I realized that I was identifying with people in the room. I realized I had a insight that the program was available to anybody in the room and I was in the room. Hope. I can still struggle with hope. If I get too hungry, too angry, too lonely, or too tired, the hope just disappears. And I don't notice that it's gone. I just, suddenly there's no way out. <laughs> We're just doomed. I have to ask God for help. I forget. Especially if things are smooth for two or three days in a row. I have religious practice. There's stuff that I do, and I'm, in, I'm involved in a couple of very good habits. But I sometimes don't remember to ask God for help until halfway through the morning. I mean, I really mean it. Help! <laughs> I was talking to somebody who, well, how do you ask God for help? <laughs> and I said, if you don't want to use words... You take out your nice white hanky <laughs> and you just wave it in a public place. <laughs> Help will come. <laughs> Help will come. <sighs> Dr. Gill, uh, as he aged, uh, and I'm very, I'm very, I'm very aware of aging. Um, he, he went blind, macular degeneration, and pretty deaf. His mind was still pretty sharp. I wanted him to come to Oakland to talk to uh, my home group, which is Tuesday nights at Central Office at 6.30. And at, I don't know how this happens. We are full of young people. I don't know how that happened. Full of young people. Tattooed, wearing black. Young people. <laughs> And uh, we have a, a, a row of old-timers. We just disapprove, and we sit there, and we disapprove of everybody. So, <laughs> But I wanted a guild to come so they would have a chance of, of hearing this wonderful example of recovery in human beings. So Gil came. He came a couple of times. And, and he stood up, and he was like 91 at the time. And he started by saying, I hope I am... Facing the right way, I cannot see you. <laughs> and 
And then he said, I hope I am not shouting. My, my, I, I cannot, I cannot hear. <laughs> and then he said, my name is Gil. And I'm a recovering gynecologist. <laughs> And in those few minutes, all the differences between a, you know, an elegant physician from a different country and culture, greatly older than all these young people may ever be, it was gone. They were with him. And then he told his story as simply as any of us tell our stories. And then we fall in love with him. I, I got sober in Berkeley. I was in Berkeley for a year. My ordination to the priesthood was held up for a year because you should not make a major change in your life your first year. Da, 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 da. So um, <laughs> I found that very difficult, and I went back to teach in Los Angeles, um, and I was there for the next four years. And my second year of sobriety was my first year back in the classroom, and I think it was the most difficult year of my sobriety. I had no tools. I was not drinking, I was not using, I was going to meetings, but I had no tools. Uh, meetings helped, but I, all of a sudden I'm, I'm back at, in the real world. And, um, oh, I, I wrote, uh, the Archbishop, I said I was coming down and, are there any sober priests in town? I'd sure like to meet one. And Cardinal Manning, lovely man, wrote me right back and said, welcome, I, I want to meet you when you get here and when you get to town call. Terry R., and I, I, uh, who is a priest in recovery, he is now a sober monsignor, and that's very rare. <laughs> um, I got to L.A. on a Friday. I went to a meeting Friday night, two on Sunday, two on Saturday. Monday morning, I called him, and I said, uh, uh, he got a copy of the letter. I said, I need a sponsor. And he said, when did you come to L.A.? I said, Friday. He said, have you been to a meeting? I said, I've been to five. He said, of course, I'll be your sponsor. He loves sponsoring desperate men. And uh, <laughs> over the year, it took me a while to trust him. It took me a while to, to see how he does things. It took me a while to trust anybody. I had a drinking dream this past year uh, that I'd like to talk about for a moment. And... And uh, early in my recovery, I would have them, and I felt shame around them. I didn't know what they meant. Does it mean that I'm not trying hard enough? Is it a prophecy? Is it an omen? Uh, I, you know, I was afraid I would mention it at a meeting, and they'd say, oh, you're very bad. You have to write the big book out in longhand. That's what I was afraid. <laughs> so I just kept it to myself. And um, But when I got to Los Angeles and, and hanging out with Terry a lot, uh, I finally asked him, I said, what does it mean? I, I didn't want him to think I was doing it. Right. You don't want to give your sponsor too much information, as you know. So I said, what, what does it mean if someone in a different state <laughs> is having drinking dreams? And he said, uh, have you had the one yet? And then he just told this disgusting, perverted, nasty dream. And I said, absolutely not. And then six months later, I had that dream. So anyway, <laughs> what's it mean? He said, well, a couple of things. Number one, he said, uh, drinking dreams remind us of what we used to be. He said, sometimes it's a hard reminder, but it's, it's a good thing to, to have that reminder sometimes. Uh, he also said... Uh, People who have drinking dreams don't get drunk. I said, explain that. He said, did you ever have a drinking dream when you were drinking? <laughs> he said, only sober people get them. And I, 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 that was such a relief to hear. I know at 10 years... Uh, uh, sober, I had a dream so vivid I woke up knowing I had lost 10 years. And I, I was my second or third cup of coffee before I realized, you know, no vomit, no pee. I didn't go out last night. <laughs> anyway, I had one in the past year, and here's the dream, and I want to talk about it a little tiny bit. Um, I'm flying somewhere. I'm in a plane. There are no empty seats. I'm in the middle seat. 
and the uh, uh, flight attendant is not looking my way. No one is looking my way. And on the floor by my right foot, I have a glass of Sauterne. It's not my drink. But I have a, and I make sure no one's looking, and I reach down, and I pill it up, and I take a little sip, and then I put it down again. Now, very shortly after that, I wake up, and what I wake up with is not the, the, the memory of what the action, but the feelings were there, and the feelings I woke up with were feelings of shame, and guilt, and embarrassment, and self-loathing. I wrote a little bit about that, and I made a few phone calls to talk to a couple of people about that, my sponsor being one. And what it brought back to me was a lot of what it was like. When I'm drinking, I've got secrets. I simply can't let you know what's really going on. I mean, I did silly little secret things like Drinking iced tea and vodka because no one knew you could do that. And they thought I was drinking iced tea. Things like sneaking out to get a bottle. Things like putting scotch in milk so no one would wonder. Little thi- but, but secrecy, I'll tell you a little bit of the story and you a little bit of the story. But no one gets the whole story. One of the very good things about recovery is I don't have any secrets. People who know me know me well, and they're not surprised when things go wrong. <laughs> uh, and and thank God for the tenth step that says when wrong, promptly admitting it. I'm wrong a lot, and I I don't have to be defensive about that. I can I can practice telling the truth even when I have done something profoundly stupid, which has happened in real historical time. Um, I was, uh, anyway, back to hope for just a second. I was, uh, I took a little break and went on a private retreat in New Mexico. Uh, me and some silence and a big book. And I, I read stories in the back and, and prayed with the monks. This was a Benedictine place. They've been doing what they do for about 15 centuries. They've worked out some of the kinks. And um, I was 20 years sober, and the question I had was, how did I get from a place of no hope, step one, to a place of some hope, step two, and then then the third step of turning it over, and then proceeding through the other steps? And, And here's what occurred to me at 20 years sober and hope. I did not think my way from step one to step two. That's what I would prefer to do. In fact, what I would prefer to do is go to my room by myself and figure it out one more time. This is my first impulse. Sometimes I get into it. Um, I did not uh, walk from step one to step two. I did not crawl from step one to step two. I got carried from step one to step two. I went to meetings, I surrounded myself with women and men in the program, and one day I woke up at a meeting and I had a little bit of hope. The door opened. I think in the Old Testament there's a reference to being let out of the fowler's snare, you know, out of the, out of the cage, out of the trap, and, and it felt like that. I, I, I want to tell a story, then I want to talk about defects of character, and then I'm done. Um, I go to meetings because I find it helpful. I, I find um, the rule of thumb that I, I follow is you got to go where you're fed, and you have to go where you can breathe. And usually for me, meetings have nourishment and oxygen. Not all meetings. My sponsor claims he has never been to a bad AA meeting. Ha! Um, <laughs> he also said, if you, like everybody you've met in AA, it's a pretty good sign you haven't been to a lot of meetings. I, that I like. But I heard this at a meeting. This person was describing, 
alcoholism the disease. And, and you know, there's a Dr. Silkworth's wonderful description of allergy of the body and obsession of the mind. And I've got it. I'm obsessed with it. And I'm allergic to it. And I, I just can't leave it alone, you know. So this guy said, alcoholism is a lot like dancing with a gorilla. You're not done dancing until the gorilla is done dancing. <laughs> This kind of talks about powerlessness, lack of control. Uh, and just to be truth, you know, I want no secrets from you. When I heard the story, he didn't say dancing. <laughs> He said dating. <laughs> And he didn't say dating. But, but you've got the image, right? Now, I'll tell you, I, the right gorilla thrills me to this day. There are some gorillas who can perk me up like nothing else does. And we want to play with them. We want to have a good time with them. This is great. Let's dance. And, and so many of us are killed by the gorilla. The casualty rates are Horrific. In my little home group on Tuesday night, we, we lost two women in six months. Uh, both went out one more time for one more dance, and, and they didn't come back. I have a friend in Las Vegas named Wally, and he says, Tom, I don't want to dance with the gorilla, but every so often I want to pet it just a little bit. <laughs> Gorillas are big and strong, and when the gorilla has his arms around me, the gorilla's in charge. Now... If you're clean and sober today, it means the gorilla has let go. It doesn't mean you're smarter than the gorilla or faster than the gorilla. It got bored with you and it just put you down for a little while. If the gorilla has let go, get out of the cage. <laughs> And don't go back into the cage even when the gorilla starts humming your song, which it does. Oh, no, I'm sure that'll never happen to me after the last time. No, 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 police goats, it was nasty. I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> and then the moon's full and you're a little restless and you hear music. Oh, maybe just once more. Now, people who love us Visit the zoo a lot. <laughs> they look at the lions and they look at the tigers. They look at the bears, you know. And then they come to the gorilla cage and they look inside and they see the person they love with the gorilla and they react. Now, it might be their spouse. It might be their mom or their dad. It might be uh, a brother or sister, best friend. It might be one of their kids or grandkids. That's the new group coming into Allen on parents and grandparents. They want to do something. They want to take action. So they get into the cage. <laughs> and they begin sweeping and vacuuming and rearranging the furniture and making nice, nutritious meals. They hang inspirational things. A picture of the Dalai Lama, something in Chinese. None of that helps. So they get between the gorilla and the person they love and they try to separate them. And the gorilla turns on them and yanks their arms and legs off. The casualty rates among the people who love us, are very high, emotionally, physically, spiritually. So they need a program too. And it's called Al-Anon. And a lot of the Al-Anon program comes down to stay Out of the cage. <laughs> Look. 
let's all repeat that. Stay out of the cage. And I respond, but I just want to vacuum a little. I mean, the vacuuming doesn't help. We're meeting over by the giraffes. And we're going to talk about our vacuuming needs. And the focus is on our crazy. And let me tell you, focus on my crazy can take up a whole meeting. I, I uh, find the tenth step very helpful. I've mentioned that before. When wrong, not if wrong. I noticed, um, I think my first ten years of sobriety, I was wrong, oh, half a dozen times. And now, <laughs> now I'm fine, I find I'm wrong a lot on, on so many areas. And... It doesn't always feel good. Quick example, I, um, um, I got sober in 76. I was ordained a uh, priest in 1978 uh, in San Francisco, and um, I do lots of things uh, that, that involve that. Um, I'm, I'm, the le- I'm the leader of my community in Oakland. There's five or six of us, and something was going on. And the boss, who lives in Los Gatos, uh, called a couple of us down to have a conversation about the community, and I'm saving you all the dreary details. Anyway, there we are, and he asked me a direct question, and I lied. Now, I want you to know, I didn't have to struggle to lie. I didn't have to wonder. It just, like syrup, you know? It was just smooth, and 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 I, I was lying for the common good, so I don't think that's really a problem. Um, <laughs> And then we drove back home, and uh, it, the, ta- the bad taste was in my mouth. It, was, it just tasted bad. Um, and I, I was baffled by this. I was upset by this. I was perplexed by this. And I, had to, I mentioned this to a couple of people, and I knew that I had to clean up the mess. And the next morning, I, I emailed uh, the boss, uh, and I said to him, You asked me about so-and-so yesterday, here's a much better answer, and I gave him the right answer. Uh, So I'm very capable of things like that, and I'm grateful for the tenth step. Um, I didn't have to grovel or scream or shout. I mean, lying comes very easy to me, and I just need to keep an eye on it, because if I don't keep an eye on it, it just sneaks in. What's interesting is the bad aftertaste. My experience of conscience is not the one that says, oh, Tom, you're great. That's usually not my conscience. My conscience is the one that wakes me up at four in the morning and says, you did it again. So I'm out in New Mexico with 20 years ago. I'm reading the story of the first guy from Chicago um, who uh, got sober, and he meets with Dr. Bob. They spend some time in the fourth edition of the book. This is on page 263. And the guy writes, Dr. Bob led me through all these steps. At the moral inventory, he brought up several of my bad personality traits or character defects, such as, now notice, so it's this guy's stuff, but Dr. Bob's doing the talking. Haven't you wanted to do that with some of your sponsees? (laughs) Just so you know, uh, at least one person did this in Akron. He brought up several of my bad personality personalities. He's been observing this guy. Physicians observe. So do nurses. It can be frightening. He brought up several of my character defects, such as selfishness, conceit, jealousy, carelessness, intolerance, ill temper, sarcasm, and resentments. Now, the reason these jumped off the page when I read these 20 years ago is these are mine. I've got uh, selfishness, conceit, jealousy, carelessness. I'm intolerant. Uh, I have ill temper. I can be sarcastic. And boy, do I get resentments. And, and um, the, the, the guy goes on to write, this picture is still vivid. Uh, let me see. We went over these at great length. He finally asked me if I wanted these defects of character removed. When I said yes, we both knelt at his desk and prayed, each of us asking, asking to have these defects Taken away. This picture is still vivid. If I live to be a hundred, it will always stand out in my mind. Um, and if you don't get to the stories in the book, you'll never find out how Dr. Bob works with people. This guy, by the way, gets drunk again. 
even though he did this with Dr. Bob, he gets drunk again. Lots of people do. Even among the first hundred saints, some of them didn't stay sober. Oh, well. Um, So I'm talking to my sponsor about defects of character because I still have my defects of character. I was at a meeting in Los Angeles and I said I still get angry. And someone said there, if I did it right, that wouldn't happen. I would never be angry if I did it right. And because of my perfect Al-Anon program, (laughs) I simply said, thank you, that's very helpful. (laughs) No sarcasm left in me. (laughs) Um, So here's here's what my sponsor shared with me. The, the, The step says we ask to have these removed. We do not ask to have these erased. And stuff can be removed and it moves right back especially if you have earthquakes like where I do. Uh, furniture can move all over the room. And when I'm spiritually fit, when, I, when I'm doing the footwork of the program, if I'm asking God for help, I don't have much trouble with my selfishness, conceit, jealousy, carelessness, intolerance, ill temper, sarcasm, or resentment. But if I cut corners, and I have, if I cut back a little here and fudge a little there, these can get in groups of two and three and ambush me and anyone else in the room. Goodness. Um, I heard this from uh, one of my Al-Anon mentors. Uh, Perhaps some of you Texans know her, a woman named Blanche from uh, Round Rock, one of those obscure little places. And Blanche said when she was a little girl growing up in northern Florida, she was taught some things that just weren't true. One of the things she was taught was what you don't know can't hurt you. And she said what I did not know about alcoholism almost kill four people. She also said I was taught as a little girl that God helps those who help themselves. And she said, that's not true. You know, God helps those who ask. And I need to remember to ask. I I ask for enough for today. Give me enough faith. Give me enough hope. Give me enough charity and kindness. I'd like to report to you that usually by about 8.30, they're gone. (laughs) 8.30 p.m., I used to return phone calls like at 9, 10 p.m. I can't do that anymore. I would just say, no one likes you, drink. That's what I would say. Um, If I put in a full day, I'm done by the end of the day. And what I need is some sleep and and, uh, a bit of prayer. And I'll return my phone calls starting at 9 o'clock in the morning. And there are other people in North America with phones. And I have to trust this. Gads. So um, I ask God for help. And um, I don't know what the future holds. Blanche also said, I think it's a song from, uh, uh, words from a Baptist song. Um, I don't have to know what the future holds because I know who holds the future. And when I remember that, I am less anxious. And I am less hostile. I'm still... Um, a bit of a pessimist, but I think I'm a pessimist with a good attitude. <laughs> I sponsor some people. I'm very lucky in that. Uh, one of the and and if I go to meetings, my experience is you'll meet people who are very different than than you are, and and your world gets stretched. Uh, you'll meet people that used to scare you, or you just spent your whole day disapproving of, and suddenly you're having lunch. Um, that has sure happened to me. I, I, uh, all my bigotry and prejudice, and I've got lots of it. I, I, I was raised very racial. I was raised in all kinds of be careful of this and watch out for them. They don't look like us. All that was part of my growing up. And I've had to unbend a lot of those wires to be uh, a sober uh, adult in my, in my own life. Anyway, I, one of my sponsees is a, 
a fellow from a Latino background, a gangbanger from Modesto, covered with tattoos, lots of prison time. And um, he, he somehow got sober and somehow wanted to stay sober. I had nothing to do with it. And uh, we spent some time together and talked program a bit, and we did things together. Uh, I, I drove him down uh, to take his driver's test. He had stolen cars, but he never had a driver's license before. So <laughs> this was very grown up. And uh, I sat him down once and I said, uh, you know, um, as, you, as you grasp and develop your manner of living and recovery, your world is going to get bigger. Uh, there'll be opportunities you literally never dreamed of. You'll be talking to people who used to frighten you. Uh, you know, all of this, and, and it's a very good thing, and so make sure you get enough rest and, and, and uh, have friends and allies and companions. My sponsor loves that mantra of having friends, allies, and companions, all of us in the 12-step programs. And this uh, young man um, looked at me and he said, I am hanging out with an old white guy. I am stretching a lot. <laughs> and he still is. And he, uh, he went to uh, junior college, and now he is in his junior year at San Francisco State. He's going to be uh, a drug counselor and work with gangs. And uh, without the program, I never would have met him. Without the program, I never would have met you. Thank you, Kristen Butte. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.